Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully you are here for the SBIR STTR webinar, introductory webinar. Uh, in case you don't know the acronyms, that is the Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Technology Transfer Research Program. All right, um, we're going to get started right now. It's just turning 10 o'clock. Uh, we've got probably a good hour's worth of material to cover. Um, there is a chat box. If you have questions, you can type your questions into the chat box, and I will see it. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of material, so we're going to try to um, I'll try to address questions going throughout, and then I'll try to leave a little bit of room at the end for additional questions. Hopefully, uh, the material we've got together will uh, answer most of your questions as we go. So my name is Ed Ober. I will be your presenter today. I am a senior associate with Grant Management Associates. And some of the things we're going to cover today. What is the SBIR program and STTR? Uh, what, are, what agencies participate in the program? What are the differences between the two uh, aspects of the program? Who can be a principal investigator? The benefits? What typically goes into an application? The different topical areas of interest that the agencies are interested in? Who's eligible to apply for this? Some examples of SBIR funded projects? How to decide if you're a good candidate and should pursue this? and some upcoming workshops you may be interested in attending. And there'll be some other topics in here as well. So Grant Management Associates is a woman-owned small business. Kristen Cooper Carter is a fantastic grant writer. She founded GMA about 10 years ago, um, started her career with CSU Chico, and um, was, the, was a professor there in one of their departments. Uh, full professor and also managed the grant department there for a number of years before starting Grant Management Associates. We're now a nationwide firm. We've got about 20 associates nationwide uh, with different specialties and different technical areas. Uh, we do specialize in environmental and technology grants, but we also do work in other areas as well, but those are our focus areas. We've raised over $300 million in the last 10 years for our clients. Kristen has over 30 years of experience developing proposals with multiple clients, large and small. She's worked as an SBIR consultant with many businesses and has worked on at least 30 different SBIR and STTR proposals, winning a number of those and engaging with the agencies in negotiations and finalizing all of the contracts and so forth that are part of that process. Uh, again, my name's Ed Ober. I'll be presenting for you today. I've been with GMA for about five years. I've raised probably about $60 million worth of grants in that time. And I also work in the environmental and technology uh, focus areas. So what is SBIR and STTR? Again, the name Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Research Programs, they're both non-dilutive federal funding sources to help small businesses develop and commercialize innovative solutions. And for most of these opportunities, they're looking for solutions to existing problems that the agencies are interested in. There are a few areas where you can propose solutions to things that they may not have realized are issues yet. For example, National Science Foundation, but for the most part, most of the agencies have prescribed lists of topics that they're very interested in solving, and those are the things that they um, are funding from year to year. And we'll go over some of those. A Little bit of background on SBIR. It was created in 1982. <clears throat> um, it's basically an early stage seed fund for entrepreneurs. It is the largest uh, entrepreneurial funding program uh, in the country. It was originally started as an economic stimulus program. It is not a subsidy or um, intended to help struggling businesses. 
Um, that is not the point at all. It is intended to advance technology and to bring breakthrough innovations to commercialization or to help them get to commercialization. Uh, as many of you may know, if you're entrepreneurs, there is this valley of death in the, in the early beginning of a business where it's very difficult to get funding um, prior to having a prototype. And that is exactly the stage of development that SBIR is intending to address. So they're looking for significant potential in that sweet spot, valley of death, and they will help fund get you across that valley to, to the next stage. There are 11 federal agencies that participate in the program. Um, some of them only work with SBIR. Some of them do both the STIR, STTR and SBIR programs. Um, as you look at this list of agencies, um, keep in mind that there's a lot of crossover between the topics. So you can't judge an agency by its name. There's a lot of times where they will fund things that you wouldn't necessarily think would fit into their title. So for example, Department of Defense, in addition to funding weapons and things that support soldiers, they're also very interested in climate change and energy and transportation, um, things that you might think of as falling under other agencies. But Department of Defense covers a, a wide gamut of, of subjects, and as, as is the case with many of these agencies. They do publish their lists of topics, and we're going to go through some of those here in a few minutes. The application specifics do vary from agency to agency. So today's workshop is kind of an overview of all 11 agencies. I'm not gonna have time to drill down extensively into each agency individually. We're gonna have workshops later in the year that we're gonna do that, kind of break the agencies out and each workshop will focus uh, more in depth on uh, just a couple of the agencies at a time um, and help you work through preparing uh, your applications. Uh, so here today, we're just going to kind of do an overview of what's relevant to pretty much all of them, and we'll do a little bit of drilling down into what are the differences between some of the agencies. So what are the goals of the SBIR program? First and foremost, meet federal research and development needs. This is important um, because a lot of times people come to SBIR with their own agenda of what they want to produce, and they're looking for a grant source to uh, fund it. Um, in some cases, that'll work. Uh, NSF in particular is very broad-based topics, and just about anything can fit into one of their topics. Um, with most of the other agencies, that's not the case. They've got very specific needs that they're looking at, and if you don't fall uh, cleanly within one, um, you're probably going to going to run up against uh, competitors that are more closely aligned than you are. So understanding the federal research needs of the agency that you're dealing with is really important. Um, secondly, they're looking for potential to commercialize products into the market, whether that market is the private sector or the federal government sector. Um, both of those are options as far as commercialization is concerned. And across the board, SBIR is very much interested in innovations. And we're going to talk more about what innovation means in the context of this program. They want to foster and encourage participation in innovation and entrepreneurship by socially and economically disadvantaged persons. So people that fall into these groups of either you know, some sort of disadvantaged class get uh, a little competitive advantage in the competition. And it's very much an entrepreneurial venture. So uh, small businesses, startup businesses are very much encouraged. And we'll go through some slides a little bit later that show kind of the breakdown of who typically receives awards in this program. Uh, the STTR program is intended to be a cooperative between um, small businesses and research institutions. As you may know, there's a number of re uh, research institutions that regularly develop technologies or innovations um, that they may own uh, the rights to and through this program those rights become transferred to the small business partner who can then take that technology through to commercialization through some sort of licensing or other arrangement with the research institution.
Okay, um, so not all agencies participate in SBAR. Uh, usually you have to have an extramural R&D budget of over $100 million, uh, which are required to participate. This comes out to about a 2.8% uh, set aside from those agencies on average. The program in total generates about 5,000 new awards every year. So that's quite a bit. If you think about uh, the amount of money coming through this program, that is a substantial amount of money, about 2.2, maybe $2.5 billion. I think it's up to 2.8 uh, this year. Some of these statistics are pro I'm providing are from the most uh, recent year that they published information for. So uh, two, 2015 is the most recent year that we've got a lot of data on. So you'll see that date floating throughout the presentation. Um, approximately $20 billion via 100,000 awards since 1983. And about a million and a half persons are now employed as a result of the SBIR program. One in nine SBIR awardees have attracted further equity financing. That is a really important statistic because that is one of the outcomes of the SBIR program. One of the goals is to attract follow-on financing needed to, uh, to get the product into the market. And in some cases, there'll be more uh, project work that needs to be done before it gets to market. So we'll talk a little bit about that further too. So here's a little profile of uh, the awards that have been given out over the last few years, again, starting with uh, 2015. So here you can see in that year, uh, we had 17,000 proposals that were submitted for phase one. Of those, about 2,800 were awarded. So that was about 16% award rates. And then of those, 2,800 submitted phase two proposals. So that's almost the entire group of uh, phase one awardees submitted. And 97% and of those 1,454 received awards for a percentage of about 51% getting phase two awards. So you can see phase one is much more competitive uh, than phase two. Um, and I think that's the way they like it because they want many of the phase two, phase one awardees to move on to phase two. So we can see these um, technologies actually blossom into a prototype and do further uh, demonstration and testing on them. So you can look back through the years and see that percentage rates are pretty consistent. Uh, you know, they fluctuate a little bit, but they, they really vary around, you know, 15 to 20 percent on phase one awards and around 50 percent on phase two awards across the board. OK, the, the STTR program um, has the largest five agencies participating. It's a, it's a much smaller set aside than SBIR. It's only about a half a percent. Um, for agencies with uh, more than a $1 billion budget, um, which works out to about $350 million a year for STTR. Still a good amount of money, but not nearly as much as SBIR. And in this program, uh, there's a requirement that you have to partner with a research institution. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now with the SBIR, you don't have to partner with a research institution, although it may very well help your application to do so. Um, but with STTR, you are required to do so. Okay, in the STTR program, again, looking at the breakdown of proposals, I, in the most recent year, we had about 2,600 proposals, about 553 awards for about 20 per six, 20.6% 20, 20 uh, award ratio in phase one. Um, about 62% of them uh, applied for phase two, and again, about 50% of those uh, received awards. So this is for the STTR program. Some of the differences between SBIR and STTR. So again, the partnering requirement is one of the key differences. With SBIR, you are allowed to partner, and with STTR, you are required to partner. Um, with SBAR, the primary em employment of the principal investigator must be with the small business, at least 50% of their time. With STTR, they could be employed by either the research institution or the small business. Similar requirements about the percentage of time will apply. There is a work requirement on the third line here. You can see that with SBAR, you can subcontract 
up to 33% in phase one of your project to a um, research institution or subcontractor. Um, and with STTR, you have to have at least 40% of the work being done by the small business and 30% being done by the research institution partner. You can have more, so there's an extra 30% there that you could allocate uh, to even another partner or you could divvy up uh, however you like. So these are two minimums here. The small business has to do at least 40% of the work and the research partner has to do at least 30% of the work. Uh, the program size, again, oops, sorry. Program size, uh, again, for fiscal year 16 here, we've got $2.5 billion, 3.2% set aside, and STTR was about 0.45% in that year. Um, <clears throat> SBIR does allow, some agencies will allow uh, VC ownership, venture capital uh, ownership. That is not allowed for the STTR program. And with SBIR, there is 11 major agencies participating and only five with STTR. In both programs, the small business is always the applicant and always the awardee. Um, but again, we can have subcontractors for dividing up the workload. Okay, some timelines for the awards, just to give you a sense of how long this process takes. Um, Average months between phase one proposal deadline and start of award, you can see varies significantly by agency. With uh, DOD, it's 2.3 years, and with HHS, it's, oh, sorry, 2.3 months, and with HHS, this can be 6.6 .6 months. Um, so there's quite a, quite a range there between, uh, between the time that you uh, get your award and the time that, uh, sorry, the deadline and the uh, award start date. Um, you can see there's a number of other differences here in terms of uh, uh, the percentage of dispersed awards in less than six months. Um, they're all, these ones are pretty close uh, between 80 and 100 um, percent. The average month spent between phase one and in phase two start is very significant. You can see here in some like DOE, your average month is only five. Uh, 5.3 months, but in others like EPA, you've got 15 months. That's more than a year between uh, the end of phase one and the start of phase two. Um, and there are some reasons why that may be, uh, depending on the agency specifics and their requirements and the types of projects that they're looking at. And again, um, I know there's a lot of data in some of these slides, so I will make these available. Uh, in a PDF format um, after the webinar for those of you who would like to download these. I will post a link somewhere um, where you can get access to them. Okay, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the differences in some of the agencies. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it's, um, you know, as an overview, it's kind of nice to see some of the differences and some of the options that the agencies have. So with DOD as an example, Army typically does between two and 3,000 SBIR phase one proposals. Oh, sorry, two and three, yeah, they fund between, they receive between two and 3,000 a year and they fund between 10 and 15% of them. Um, for DOD, phase one awards are comprised of a base amount, which doesn't exceed $100,000 in six months. And they also offer an option one, a phase one option, which is an additional $50,000 and four months of effort. So if you get both of those, that could be $150,000 and 10 months. Phase two is typically two years long, has a ceiling of a million dollars. Um, and phase three and phase three is very popular in DOD military. They're oftentimes the customer as well as the investor. So oftentimes um, DOD will become a purchaser of your technology once it's completed phase two and moving into phase three. The Army has a huge uh, array of topics that they cover. Almost any topic you can imagine. Uh, they've got a very large list of topics and very diverse. So again, they cover everything from climate change, chemistry, weapons and warfare, 
uh, vehicles, energy, um, all different kinds of things. DARPA is looking for the most advanced. Uh, SOCOM is looking for quick deployment. And Navy has the biggest phase three program in terms of buying technology from the SBAR companies. But DOD is a contracting agency, which means they're very specific about what they're looking for from their vendors. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the differences between contract and grants uh, in, a, in a later slide. A um, couple other things to mention. They also, at the DOD, have a couple of additional programs here. They have TAAs, uh, which is uh, Technical Assistance Advocates. Um, and they are within several of the Army organizations with a focus on helping to commercialize the technologies that were developed in phase two. Um, so they do a great job of assisting with that. And they have another program called CRP, which is the Commercialization Readiness Program. Um, and that increases Army SBIR technology transition ability. Uh, and they have a separate investment fund uh, to enhance uh, that work. Uh, that happens in phase two. Uh, they also have a program called CBD, which is the Chemical and Biological Defense Program, and that focuses in particular chemical and biological warfare types of products. HHS and NIH is uh, one of the larger programs. They've got 24 institutes and centers. Uh, the NIH is the largest um, of the HHS departments. They do both grants and contracts, uh, depending on the type of solicitation uh, and subject matter. And the way they work um, is they have uh, parent SBAR and STTR um, opportunity announcements that are released in January, and then they'll release additional uh, opportunity announcements periodically that will um, build on top of those parent ones. So they'll have general topics and then more specific topics that will come out throughout the year. Um, with HHS, one of the nice things is they do have second or third phase two projects. Um, they recognize that in the medical industry, it oftentimes takes a lot of testing and a lot of uh, pre-commercialization work to actually get a new drug or a new uh, procedure into the marketplace uh, because of regulations and clinical trials and all that sort of stuff. So um, while the phase two is still two, 24 months, um, they have additional phase two opportunities where you can get an additional phase two project on the same technology. So in HHS and a couple of other agencies, you'll, you'll see some projects uh, actually take number of years to get to market and they are supported throughout that process in many cases by the, S the SBIR program. Um, they also offer a fast track ability which is you can combine uh, phase one and phase two together. Um, not every agency offers that capability and uh, so that's one of the unique things about HHS. And again, the phase 2B is they have subsequent phase twos uh, if you qualify for that. The DOE is a granting agency that works more like a contracting agency um, in terms of being very specific about what they're looking for. So their grants are actually grants, but they're very proscriptive um, and specific about what they're looking for. Their mission is to ensure America's security and prosperity by addressing energy, environmental, and nuclear challenges. Three very specific things, but also a couple of broad topics in there with energy and environmental. Nuclear is fairly specific. The three goals for this agency include clean energy technologies, science and engineering leadership, and nuclear security. And there's a whole lot of topics that fall under these three goals, and they're listed in the uh, annual solicitation. And one of the things unique about this agency is they do require a letter of interest or letter of intent be submitted within just a few weeks of the solicitation coming out. So this is one of those agencies where you really need to be on the ball with, uh, with the solicitation and have that letter of intent in on time or else you will not be considered for the full application. With this agency, again, they're usually 
somewhere between 150 to 225 thousand dollars for phase one, six to 12 months. Phase two is usually up to a million and a half dollars for 24 months. That's fairly common uh, average at the agencies. The NSF, one of my favorite agencies for SBIR because they are less prescriptive in their topics. Um, they are looking for transformational game-changing technologies that are highly disruptive. There must be good science, genuine innovation, real technological risk. They're not looking for market risk here. Oftentimes I see customer or uh, clients talking about the risk of acceptance in the market. That is not the kind of risk they're looking for. They're looking for the technological risk of actually the technology doing what you think it's going to do. So this is very much a program where you are testing basic concepts and seeing if they're actually going to pan out into a technology that could be commercialized. Um, and if, if it's an incremental improvement on something that's existing, it's not going to be as competitive as something that is putting a real risk out there, an, an unknown. We don't know if we can actually get this done or not, um, but we've got a great team and we think we can do it, um, but there's unknowns. That's the sort of thing they want to fund at, at NSF. Um, there will be peer reviews, um, and your team should definitely have scientific experts on, on your team. Uh, you can partner with, with scientists as well uh, as, at NSF. Um, that's usually a, a, a strong, um, strong applications usually have more than one, uh, at least one partner, sometimes more than one partner. Um, so, but it's definitely, you know, you want to have scientific expertise in your company as well as if you partner with somebody else, because again, a certain amount of the work needs to be done by your firm. Um, so you want to have qualified people on your team. Um, they do like to see commercialization of prior work that they've funded. So if you're going to come back to them year after year for more SBIR grants, and a lot of people do, um, at a certain point, probably within you know receiving half a dozen awards, they're going to want to see that you've started to commercialize some of those earlier projects before they're going to be uh, interested in continuing to fund more new projects from you. Uh, they do especially value university spin-outs, so things that are developed in a university and then spin out to be their own commercial enterprise or entrepreneurial venture. Uh, they do kind of favor um, projects like that with that kind of a background. Very strong focus on commercialization, where you have to show a significant market opportunity and how you will address it. So even though you, you're at the very beginning you know, stages of an idea, and you haven't even developed a prototype yet, uh, you already need to have been thinking about how this product would go to market um, and how you would at least propose uh, what its market would be and how you would approach that market. They do have a lot of topic flexibility in this um, agency. They do have a list of standing topics, and I'm gonna cover those in a, in a later slide. And, um, uh, but within those topics, they're very broad and um, much less prescriptive than all the other agencies that work in this program. Uh, their timeline is usually, um, got this here, over here. here. Uh, oh. um, $225,000 up to $225,000 uh, for phase one, six to 12 months, phase two up to three quarters of a million for two years. They do also offer supplements. That means they have additional funding available to help uh, with other aspects. And um, they're also very startup friendly. Uh, the typical number of employees that uh, in the firm that applies for NSF phase one is three individuals. Um, and I'll show you a slide here where it breaks that down a little bit further. Uh, the supplements. So the National Science Foundation has a variety of supplements to encourage partnerships and commercialization. In phase two, there's a phase 2B supplement, as we've talked about in one of the other agencies. Um, in this agency, what they will do is a one to two match up to $500,000. So that means if you secure a million dollar investment, NSF will provide an additional $500,000. Another phase two supplement is the TECP, which stands for Technology Enhancement for Commercial Partnerships. 
and they provide $150,000 supplement for either SBAR or STTR awardees to pave the way for partnerships uh, with a corporate partner and investors. And this would fund additional research that goes beyond phase two's project objectives in order to meet technical specs required for your commercialization partner. Very useful. Department of Education. Um, this is a much smaller program. Uh, their awards are only up to $200,000 uh, and only eight months long. And phase two only goes up to $900,000 and 24 months. Uh, some of the interesting um, projects that they've had success with, uh, Reach for the Sun uh, was a, um, a game where students grow a virtual seed into a sunflower plant. And through the process of doing that, students learn about biology and photosynthesis. Uh, Adamal Adventure is a learning app for third graders, uh, teaching them single digit addition. And this one won an award. Happy Adams is a chemistry learning tool, teaches molecular modeling. And the Zoo U is a virtual environment for presenting students with social scenarios and uh, where they need to use social skills to navigate each situation. So all different kinds of really interesting uh, projects there. Uh, they only usually do one solicitation each year in the late fall. Um, they have usually 10 phase one, five phase two awards each year. And to win in this agency, you really need a strong concept and clear differentiator. There's a lot of applicants uh, in this category. Um, you, and to be competitive here, you really have to articulate the theoretical and empirical foundations for your concepts. Okay. Department of Transportation um, has eight operating administrations. Uh, so there's quite a diversity in the different things that they're interested in between rail and um, roadways and uh, commercial vehicles and ships. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, a lot of different categories fall into this one. Um, they do contracts, not grants, so they're very prescriptive in terms of what they're looking for. Uh, a few examples of the types of things they funded. Smart Cross is one example. Uh, Smart Cross um, helps people um, uh, with crossing the light because they're distracted. So this works with cell phones to signal people when it's safe to cross the road. The solar roadways was a solar panels for use uh, in, in pavements, parking lots, roads, and highways. And Travis was uh, an intelligent automation device that improves tractor trailer location accuracy. Um, Department of Transportation has a commercialization assistance program which is a relatively new addition to their um, offerings. They only have one solicitation annually. The time of it fluctuates. So if you're interested in this one, you definitely want to sign up uh, to be notified about the dates because they do vary. OK, EPA, um, uh, they usually only do one uh, application each year in the spring. A very short window to apply, only 45 days. Uh, also, a very prescribed list of topics focusing on, as you would imagine, um, environmental concerns, water, air, climate change, resource recovery. Interestingly, Homeland Security also has an aspect for the EPA, um, since it does cover the geography of the homeland. And of course, green materials, green manufacturing are very much things they're interested in here. Up to $100,000 for six months in phase one. One up to three hundred thousand dollars in twenty-four months for phase two. So, what are the differences between grants and contracts? So, contracting agencies have highly focused topics, while granting agencies the topics are more vague and broader. Um, with contracting, the agency establishes the plans, protocols, and the requirements, and with granting agencies. The investigator is allowed to initiate the approach that they want to take. There's more fiscal requirements in contracting agencies than there are with granting agencies. Um, the agency also with contracting agencies, the agency may also be a buyer, uh, which is a very important consideration for a lot of people that go into SBIR. Um, 
And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a later slide. But one of the nice things about the SBIR is typically with federal procurement, there is a competitive aspect to most procurement processes. But if your product is selected um, through a phase two award, uh, you basically now don't have to compete with other um, entrepreneurs in order to get your product purchased by the agency. So the SBIR, in fact, acts as a competitive aspect to avoid future competition. Here's a few quick stats about STIR and SB, SBIR. Um, I'm just going to skip through those because we're kind of eating up the time here. So this is interesting. Uh, fiscal year 2015, looking at some of the budget breakouts, uh, Department of Defense, just over a billion, Department of Health and Human Services, 797 million, DOE was 206 million, NASA was 180 million, NSF was 176 million. Um, and the ones with only SBIR programs, for example, USDA only had 20.3 million. Um, so these are much smaller numbers. Uh, DHS, 17.7, Department of Commerce, 8.4, uh, DOT, um, 7.9. This gives you a snapshot across the, the country about where most of the grants are being awarded to. Um, it's really kind of an even uh, fairly well distributed breakout. You see kind of California is the big winner um, with Massachusetts coming in uh, close second. And then um, these other group of states are all pretty close uh, in award comparatively. So that would be uh, Virginia, Maryland, New York, Colorado, Texas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Florida. And then all other states together take up about a third. So California and Massachusetts together about a third. Those other uh, 10 states, about a third, and then the balance, about a third. So eligible firms, you need to be a for-profit company. You need to be US owned and operated and have under 500 employees. All of the work for the project must be done in the United States. Um, so we do have some applicants who have component parts of their company that are outside of the country, that is fine, as long as the work being proposed is all done in the United States. Um, performing R&D should be the focus of the project, not purchasing equipment or commercializing something that's already been developed. Um, and things that have low risk and only need capital are really not of interest to the SBAR program. Larger companies do qualify for SBAR by spinning off smaller ventures. Um, we've seen that happen in a number of instances. Okay, this shows you uh, the typical participants by company size. You can see the two to nine uh, employee group is by far and away the largest category of recipients receiving almost 50% of the awards. Uh, the next biggest group is the 10 to 24, and then they get smaller from there. A fair number of awards are given to uh, just individuals, you know, uh, they may be coming out of grad school or that sort of thing. That's fairly common for grad students to apply for SBIR, um, and they're oftentimes successful. So some of the best things about the SBIR program, it is non-diluted capital. The agency does not take an equity position or any ownership of your firm. There's no loss of, of ownership. Um, there's no, it's not a loan that needs to be paid back. There is no IP or data transference. Um, they do have a right to use some of the uh, information that you've gathered, but they cannot share it outside of the government for at least five years with DOD and four years with the other agencies. There's no royalty, it's not a loan, no repayment. And with many agencies, there's direct follow on phase three awards, which means there's no more competition required in order to get a contract with that agency. Typically, uh, ventures here in this window are pre venture capital or pre angel. 
And this fund will support high risk ideas that are just too risky for VCs or angels. And a lot of times, um, SBIR award awardees will find it a lot easier to get investors after they've received an SBIR grant. There are three phases in the process. Phase one, as we talked about, is usually six months to a year. Can go up to $225,000 depending on the agency. And 10 to 15% success rate is typical for phase one applicants. This is typically a 25 page proposal involved in this application. Phase two is where you uh, will develop prototype and do testing. You can go up to 24 months, um, usually up to a million and a half dollars, somewhere between a million and a million and a half is typically the top end. Some of them are a little bit lower. Um, typically 40 to 50% conversion from phase one to phase two in terms of success rate. With phase two, you have a beefier proposal, up to 50 pages is common. And then there's this triangle here showing that um, in some cases, your project may merit an additional phase two project. Um, some instances, for example, medical testing, medical product testing, or it needs to go through clinical trials is a good example where you, you probably would not expect to go from concepts uh, or prototype to commercialization in two years. Um, it's probably going to be you know, closer to five or more years to get a pharmaceutical product uh, to the market. So there may be a number of testing processes that you want to put it through before it's ready for that. And if it is, then you go back to the phase two box and proceed again. It's, uh, the subsequent phase two awards are just like the first one. And then phase three, there's no SBIR funding involved, but again, the commercialization aspect. So here's where you would get follow on funding from investors, venture capitalists, angels, um, or contract from a buyer such as uh, one of the federal agencies. Okay. Um, so only some agencies allow the secondary phase two projects. Okay, um, typical timeline for SBIR to commercialization. Um, in year one, you're basically vetting your concepts and uh, in your phase one project, you're developing your concepts and um, putting together your essential research and your market. In phase two, you're developing your prototype and testing it. And in phase three, you're getting ready to go to market or going to market. So about 50% of phase one awardees will go on to win phase two. Many companies apply regularly and repeatedly to this program. Um, it's a really important point to realize that um, you can apply multiple times to SBIR um, and you can repeatedly get, you can have multiple open awards at the same time. Um, you can get multiple awards on the same project and the same technology in some cases. In most cases you want to move on to a new technology um, but a lot of companies do that they have a pipeline of products that they're working on and you know after they have one successful application they'll immediately turn around and prepare their next product for an sbir as well so this is really a great pipeline because it's very predictable because this is a stable funding source you know it's going to be coming out pretty much every year their topics do do vary slightly from year to year, but a lot of times you can tell what they're going to be because they build off of the previous year's topics. So if you're paying attention, it can be pretty, pretty intuitive to kind of uh, predict where the, the upcoming topics are going to be landing. Having more phase one applications means you're more likely to win a phase two award, which is where the real money is. And it's important to know also that in phase one, you may not make money you may actually lose money on the phase one um, but that should be seen because phase one is a is not the end goal in itself uh, phase two is not even the end goal phase three is the real end goal and phases one and two are milestones to get to phase three so in phase one a lot of companies you know either just break even or sometimes even spending money out of pocket but they're significantly advancing their, um, their commercialization of their product. And so it's well worth uh, the investment they're putting in. 
So what goes into an application? Typically, an application will have a number of components. The most, probably the most important of them is the narrative, or called the technical volume, where you're going to talk about what the problem is that you're trying to solve, what are the opportunities in terms of market, um, what is the state of the art regarding the problem uh, or the opportunity, what is your proposed solution, uh, what is the goal of your project, technical objectives, a detailed statement of work in terms of um, understanding who is going to do what and what you're going to produce as a result of all that, which will include milestones and a schedule. Uh, this section will also include the technical feasibility of the work, uh, the qualifications and resources the team has to do the work, and your commercialization plan. There will be a budget where you have to break it all down in terms of cost and justify those costs. Um, in some cases, a commercialization report will be uh, required if you um, have received previous awards. Some agencies want to see that. It's not a requirement across the board. Supporting documents are allowed in many cases, and some of the examples of things that would qualify as supporting documents are letters of support, additional cost information on materials or equipment or, or subcontractors that you're going to use, uh, funding agreement certification, technical data rights, life cycle certification, allocation of rights, um, anything else that establishes um, your capabilities to do the project. So what does innovation mean? In the evaluation criteria, innovation is one of the main criteria for evaluation. This means that you really have to demonstrate a solid understanding of the state of the art. Um, this will involve a literature review, citations to that literature. This may not be um, something that a lot of applicants are particularly familiar with if they don't come from an academic background, if they're coming from you know, the, the work sector itself, uh, you know, they may not have um, they may not have this at their fingertips. So this is something that is really, really critical to understanding that you really do have an innovation. It's essential that you understand uh, who's been doing what in the field and what's current. And then you have to take it beyond that and take it significantly uh, forward into beyond this current state of the art. An incremental improvement is usually not high enough risk to justify the SBIR funding. But you must use the state of the art as a baseline to which to compare your innovation. They do also allow a novel application of an existing technology. So that is kind of an area, um, but again, it really needs to be a novel application. The adequ adequacy of your research plan is also very important. You have to be able to articulate exactly how you are going to conduct your research and why your plan of research is sufficient to achieve your objectives. So the agencies have a little bit of a different take on innovation in some cases. Um, here I've kind of broken out uh, how they look at innovation at the big five. DOD is looking broadly at the soundness, soundness, technical merit, and innovation of the proposed approach. While HHS is asking, does the application challenge and seek to shift the current research or clinical practice paradigm, by using novel theoretical concepts, approaches, or methodologies. So in each case, you know, they're, they're giving a different angle to innovation, but it's still looking for clear innovation. So the experience, qualifications, and facilities available to the applicant are another key part of the evaluation criteria. Um, it's not enough to believe that you can do the job. You have to demonstrate that you can do it. And so you do that by showing that the people that are on your team, the facilities that you have access to or connections with are sufficient to do the work that you've got on, uh, articulated as part of your proposal. They want challenging high-risk developments. Um, so incremental improvements on existing technologies, again, are not going to be particularly attractive. You also will need to understand anything that you're missing. Um, so in terms of personnel, space, equipment, other resources, 
Uh, you need to go into the application knowing what you have and what you don't have and how you're going to get anything that you're short. Um, and so whether that's partnering or subcontracting or purchasing what you need, I mean, there's a variety of ways you can do it, but you need to have a good plan of action about how you're going to do that. And you're going to want to get letters of commitment from uh, those resources so that they are on board with the proposal. You also want to understand the difference between, between key personnel and other personnel. Key personnel are those folks in your company who are essential to make the project happen. These people need to be defined in your application with a resume and statement of their background and qualifications. And then there's other personnel who are not as essential. They still may be technical, they still may be very important to the project, but they could be replaced. So engineers, you know, at a certain level, um, you know, lower level employees and so forth. Uh, so you can break those out and usually there'll be a handful of key personnel involved, sometimes just one and other times, you know, there'll be a, a group and other people will be brought in. So there are restrictions on who can be a principal investigator. Um, you do have to have credibility in this role. So you have to have the appropriate education, work, project management experience in order to be in this role. Um, while there's not a, like a threshold criteria, this is one of the scoring criteria and it is heavily evaluated. Uh, one of the major areas that they determine uh, who's really right for this program. They also want the PI to be primarily employed by either the small business or in the case of STTR, uh, could be the research partner um, during the project period. Now that's an interesting point because you don't have to be, they don't have to be employed there currently or during the application process, but once the project starts, there needs to be an agreement that they're gonna be primarily employed by either the applicant or the research institution. And that only needs to endure for the, for the duration of the project. Co-principal investigators, this is a question we get uh, frequently. It's not usually allowed with most agencies. Um, NIH will allow it in some cases. Um, and NSF uses the term co-PI in some cases uh, where there are sub-awardees who are research institutions. Um, and if you're interested in the co-principal investigator, you really need to talk to the program manager for your agency and your program and determine uh, if that's something that they'll support at that agency. Foreign subcontractors, um, typically not allowed. Uh, it is allowed in some cases, but again, all the work needs to be done in the United States. So if you have a subcontractor who is a foreign um, entity, uh, in some cases that will be allowed as long as the work is done in the United States and you can include travel and so forth as necessary to get them over here to do that. Some agencies, for example, DOD will not allow any work to be done by a foreign entity for national security reasons. Okay, and the other commercial, the other evaluation criteria, which is very important is commercialization. Um, in all the agencies, this is a pretty important element, although they define commercialization a little bit differently between agencies. And so this table uh, shows you some of the different ways that they look at what they mean by commercialization. I'm not gonna go through all those right now. So when you're talking about commercialization, these are the questions that you wanna be asking yourself and you wanna make sure that you have answers to these in order to go into your application to be a viable uh, candidate. And again, these slides will be available um, after the webinar. So what does a winner look like? Well, we can tell that their solution is gonna meet the agency need. So they're very much gonna focus in on what the agency is looking for. They're gonna have a very good handle on what the current state of the art is and relate it to their innovation. And their proposal is gonna be adequate in terms of communicating the path to market, describing their team and their facilities and uh, resources. And, um, and a clear work plan. 
some of the areas of interest. Uh, again, these are, I'm not going to read through all these, but you can see uh, just at a glance, there's um, quite an array of topics available under each of the agencies. And this is just a sampling. So I just, I just grabbed a few uh, just to give you an example of some of the different topics, that, but this is not exhausted by any means, but I had to stop somewhere. <laughs> um, so the DOD and HHS here, NSF, again, advanced materials, biological technologies, DOD is looking for uh, things relating to weaponry, as well as environmental. Um, also, uh, oh, that's, uh, uh, sorry, DO, Department of Education. Um, these are looking for all different kinds of things pertaining to students and teachers and administration. So really any kind of uh, product that works in any of those three broad sectors within uh, education are of interest to that agency. Department of Energy is looking for a wide array of things. We talked about everything from electron lasers to nanostructures and electric batteries, um, wide array of topics. EPA is a little bit more narrow um, in terms of focusing on environmental issues. USDA has a wide array of stuff, uh, including um, agriculture and uh, uh, husbandry and animal products and testing and raising of animals. Um, human health as it relates to food and food science. Department of Commerce has uh, two big uh, agencies within it. NIST is, I think, the largest. Um, and they also have a wide array of topics that they support. Uh, everything from advanced communications to physics and standards and transportation. Um, and each of these different topics has a number of subtopics within them. Um, so you really need to drill through their topical documents when they come out and see what aligns best with what you're working on. In some cases, there'll be multiple things that you might be interested in. Again, NIH uh, has omnibus topics. So uh, these are broad topics that they issue at the beginning of, of the year when they first announce. And then they'll have further opportunity announcements that will drill down into that topic further and ask for specific solutions to specific problems. DHS is again has another wide variety of things, but a little bit more focused on security issues. So you know things from chemical detection uh, to cybersecurity and network modeling. I mean all of these things, blockchain, all of that is uh, considered in DHS work. NASA and DOT, I think those are fairly intuitive with the kinds of things that they cover. Um, I took here an excerpt from the NIH topics document just to give you an idea of what you'll be looking at when one of these documents comes out. So here we're looking at approximately 250 page document that does nothing but talk about the topics that they're interested in. And so I've taken an excerpt from the table of contents, uh, not even the whole table of contents, just an excerpt to show you just some of the topics uh, that you can find in this particular a topic document. Um, and they do organize it nicely, so they're very, fairly easy to find. But again, you, you do need to drill down and read into these in order to understand what each of these topics is actually looking for. The names are not always clear just by the title. So um, there's a lot of reading involved here, but um, you know there's potential dollar signs behind each of these. So um, Again, these come out usually at the beginning of their year for that agency, and those topics will be good for the year. Um, they may or may not continue into the subsequent year. Sometimes there will be carryovers uh, topics. So a few success stories. Um, Gross Wen is, uh, is one where they received a total investment of $800,000. Um, this was an algae-based treatment uh, that works with uh, water as naturally occurring algae. And um, this recovers nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus from wastewater and can be used to retrofit older treatment plants to meet new water quality standards. Delphi Technology developed neutron generators. Um, they received uh, several awards on this technology. 
And there's a lot of different applications in the medical field uh, for this. Um, they received, one of the reasons I pulled this one is they received $8.7 million from the SBIR program. So that tells you right there that they received several phase two project awards on this technology alone. That's the only way they could get to $8.7 million. Fuchs Consulting uh, has a time-lapse infrared system that uh, assesses subsurface damage and corrosion like on things like bridges, tunnels, and dams. Uh, very innovative. Um, they developed a suite of products around this technology. Um, they received about a million and a half dollars from SBAR. KCF Technologies developed sensors that are used to assess damage um, on machines and different types of uh, industrial equipment. Um, their focus is on total economic optimization of industrial systems in a variety of industries. And they made a name for themselves by being a leader in predictive maintenance on machinery. Very interesting little niche. They received over $11.8 million um, on their technologies. There's a whole bunch of other success stories. You know, uh, we can only pull a few just for uh, to exemplify the program, but you know, they receive the SBIR program issues thousands of awards every year. Up to 5,000 is typical in a year across all the agencies. So there's no end to the different examples we could show you um, of companies that have been successful. Here are just a few on this slide the, of the names of the companies you're probably familiar with for a lot of these. Um, and you may not have known they had an SBIR in their history. And there's a lot more where this came from as well. So a few success tips for the SBIR program. You really want to know your potential market, even though your technology may be only in its infancy. To be successful in this competition, you really have to have a clear vision of who you're going to market this idea to and what it will be used for. There really should be a waiting market for your product. So you, in, in most cases, you want to be addressing a need that exists right now. Phase one is a step, it's not the objective. Most companies lose money in phase one, but you have to go through phase one to get to phase two. Phase two, you get a lot more money, but it's still just a step. Phase three is where you want to end up at commercialization. And in phase two, to be successful, you really need to show how you are going to get that product to market. So while in phase one, you need to identi identify the market that you intend and kind of some ideas about how you would approach it, you don't have to have a detailed marketing plan identified in phase one. But in phase two, you do. Thinking strategically, another key success tip. Don't just chase the opportunity because it's there. You have to focus on opportunities that are gonna align with your company's goals and make sure that they're clearly aligned with the intent of the solicitation and the topics that they're looking for. So don't try to put a square peg in a round hole. If it feels like it's not a clean fit, it's probably not a good fit. You wanna definitely partner and collaborate. This is one of those opportunities where collaboration really demonstrates a level of maturity of your firm. Um, understanding your shortcomings and what you need to bring in terms of other people and organizations to the table to make your project work um, is, shows the agency that you are self-aware of your capabilities and limitations and how to surpass your limitations. University partnership is one of those. Um, really can't recommend this enough. Um, a lot of people think that they don't need a university partner because they've got enough science on their own internal team. Um, that may be true, but in terms of the, the how well you'll score on the application, you'll generally come a little bit higher score if you have a partnership with the university, even if you're not having them do a whole lot of work. They could just be on the SBIR, they could have a, a minor role in your project. With the STTR, they're going to have to have a more substantial role as, as it requires. Um, but having them in any capacity is better than not having them at all. 
for the reasons stated here. Okay, a few more award uh, tips. Don't judge an agency by its name. A lot of these topics will cross over between agencies, but you do need to understand your agency's missions and needs. And in some cases, you can craft a proposal that identifies their needs, um, and in some cases uh, is outside of a specific topic, but still addresses uh, needs that they're interested in. Get to know your program agency and program manager. Um, in many cases, you can actually establish a relationship with the manager and, uh, and have a dialogue about the types of things that they like and don't like and where they're going to be heading in the future. Grant work is very much a process of reading the solicitation in detail, following the instructions very carefully. Don't depend solely on SBIR funding. You know, it's, it is risky. Phase one is only a 10 to 15% chance of award. So, you know, uh, 80 to 90% of applicants will not be successful in SBIR, so don't count on it necessarily um, as your sole source of funding. Um, and use support systems. There are many out there. Um, win or lose, you want to get and review uh, the evaluations from the agency so that you can improve on your next submission. And be persistent. Don't give up if you don't win the first time. Again, it, at only a 10 to 15% success rate, you can't necessarily expect to win your first time out the gate, but you should be persistent and you should uh, continue to apply for anything that you think you're qualified for. Um, and a lot of times you can reuse a lot of material from grant to grant. So the investment that you put into putting an application together will oftentimes um, not be wasted if you don't win. You can use a lot of that material for other grant opportunities, or for future SBIR grant opportunities. So this is a highly competitive uh, program, requires excellence in all, in all aspects of the competition. You have to have a credible project team. You have to have a viable commercialization plan in phase two. In phase one, you at least have to have identified who your intended market is gonna be. You have to write a good proposal that's appropriate to your topic, that excites the reviewers, and you want to bring on help onto your team. There is a lot of help out there to help you uh, through work through your concepts, work through the application, um, and worth your project as well. Some of the key considerations you want to think about is to whether to pursue this. Is your company an eligible applicant? Is your technology highly innovative? It really needs to be revolutionary, not evolutionary. Um, is there significant potential for your technology to solve problems or have commercial applications? And is there a significant risk to the technology development? I can't stress this one enough. You know, many agencies, especially S, uh, NSF, um, want to see that the work that you're attempting to do is not guaranteed that it's going to work. There needs to be a risk that it won't work in order for them to see the value in funding, uh, funding it at this stage. Can you develop and validate the budget, the concept within the time frame and the budget that they allocate for phase one? So that's oftentimes a challenge because sometimes developing and validating the concepts, you know, the way you've outlined it may take more than a one year time frame or more than the budget amount. And what you need to do in that case is scale down to something that fits within, uh, within those constraints and still gets you the, an outcome that will allow you to move to phase two. All the work needs to be done in the US. You need to have qualified personnel and a plan to execute. You need access to the resources you're going to need. And importantly, this needs to fit into the, time, the development timeline of your firm. So you don't want to push something uh, that is not feasible for your company to put together. Um, and you also don't want it to be too slow. Uh, if your company is moving faster, you may want to think about an opportunity where they've got a combined phase one and phase two opportunity available. There's a number of registrations required. So if you are intending to apply, you want to get started on these as early as possible. Um, done, SAM, SBIR.gov, grants.gov, um, and then a number of these are agency specific. These can take up to eight weeks to, comply, to uh, complete the registration. So you want to get started on those uh, as soon as you know. Um, here's an overview of kind of the SBIR schedule. Um, 
Their dates vary from year to year. I've tried to um, pull in the dates as far as I knew them uh, from what they've posted right now. So for example, with USDA, their phase one solicitation will come out in June. Phase two will come out in December. The application for phase one is due in October and the application for phase two is due in February. In some cases, uh, I took the date from last year because they didn't have a date for this year published. So I used the dates from last year as a proxy to understand when approximately um, these will be coming out. And again, you typically can subscribe to the agency and get notification of, of exactly when, it, uh, when it's going to be coming out. There's other resources available to help you with uh, this process. So the sbir.gov website has tutorials and videos and um, uh, lots more examples of successful projects. Um, I need to add into the link here because I do have one, sorry. There is, um, a date set for our upcoming workshop. So I wanted to give that to you. I'm going to copy it. Give me one second. I got to get it into the slide here so you can see it. Uh, can I just type in here? Okay, so I got to go over here. Sorry, bear with me one second. Okay, there we go. So there is the link now for the registration. So we are gonna be having a series of hands-on one-day workshops in the Central Valley of California throughout this year. The first one is gonna be coming up on March 1st. Um, that is a Friday. The registration is at the link provided there. It's gonna be $149, which will cover all day and materials. And uh, will be held at the China Lake Museum in Ridgecrest. So we've got limited seats available there. And what we're going to be doing is, for those people who have decided that they do want to apply for this workshop, um, or sorry, for this uh, solicitation, we'll be going through uh, three of the agencies in more detail and providing uh, guidance and actual um, uh, workshop, hands-on work in developing your scope of work, your letters of support, your budget, your narrative outline and things like that. So you're not gonna complete them during the workshop, but you'll get a good start on them. So we're gonna encourage everybody to come to the workshop with materials that they're gonna to want to put together into a, a proposal and we can get, get a jump start on that. And by the time you leave the workshop, you should have a clear work plan of what you need to do to finish the proposal so you can submit it. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, here. So um, this is another nice resource that's available. There's a, an annual conference called Tech Connect. Um, they're usually, uh, well, they have locations in different places each year. This year it's going to be in Boston. Um, it's a very nice conference uh, with uh, several days activity, including a one-day SBIR workshop for about the same price that we're doing, um, but you don't have to fly across the country. To access it but it's a great workshop if you're going to be in Boston or, or you know the, the traveling out there is not an issue for you I definitely recommend participating because it's a great opportunity to network and partner with potential firms who can assist you with your project they also accept uh, pitching at this event and they do have an opportunity to uh, pitch your ideas to investors and other partners so there is an aspect of that uh, to their event as well it's very nice um, again, the sbir.gov site has tutorials, which I do encourage. Um, you can also get assistance from PTAC and SBDC, which is the Small Business Development Corporation that's available in a lot of communities. Um, also, the agency district offices for the 11 agencies that we uh, talked about today um, can all offer some help. And then grant consultants, such as Grant Management Associates, are available to help you with your application. Um, if you're interested in grant management, here's our contact information. And some of the things that we can help you with is agency liaison, developing your project concept, your application. Um, we can do just a review or we can quarterback the whole process for you. 
helping you develop supporting documentation if needed, project analysis, strategic consulting, identifying and recruiting partners, and other services as well. So um, that pretty much covers the slides. I can, we've got a few minutes for questions. If I can, uh, if anybody has a question they want to put into the chat box, I will be happy to try and answer it. No? I'm not seeing anything. Okay, well then uh, we will call it a day for today. Um, I am going to have, I think we've got your email addresses from your registration. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post the slides in a PDF format where you can download them and then I'll send an email link to everybody where you can get the, uh, the presentation from. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you, well, Ed. Thank you for coming today. I hope that was informative, and we look forward to seeing some of you at the upcoming workshop in Ridgecrest. And again, we're going to have two more later in the year. One's going to be in Chico, and one will be in Salinas. So um, we'll hope to see you then, and good luck with your grant endeavors.